travelers and welcome to the versus stars podcast all my loyal listeners thank you for continued support and remember click subscribe button everybody it's an amazing episode because mark Irwin boards the mothership he is the senior vp of business development at mad cave comics we discuss mad cave's licensing of gotchaman come boards go traversing the stars hello mr Irwin. thank you so much for coming to the versus stars podcast thanks for having me totally my pleasure so we start off with a question of inspiration to inspire your love for comics and who your earliest influences? Oh, um, well, I was I had a couple of hippie uncles uh, who uh, gifted me at a very early age, way too early, actually, with uh, a lot of National Lampoon and Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers. And uh, that sort of got me on the path. And then uh, a little bit later on, I started discovering Marvel and DC Comics and um Kind of the thing that solidified my path into the comic field was uh, at a, still at a fairly early age. I discovered Bernie Wrightson. Mm. Um, I wanted to be Bernie. I wanted to be that good. I wanted to draw like that guy. Uh, I wanted to ink like him, and uh, it just kind of took off from there. <laughs> I'm just I'm just looking at uh, behind you. That's a great library of books you got there. That's uh, Blackest Night. I see right behind you as well. Yeah, Very yeah. Cool. <laughs> Those are all books I worked on. So. Oh, really? What did you do in Blackest Night? I was an anchor on uh, a lot of that series. So. Oh, that's also awesome. That's what I'm, you know, I'm a Green Lantern nerd. So it's, it's a, it was a great time to be a Green Lantern fan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was super fun to work on. And uh, I was very thankful to work on that series. So are all the ones behind you ones that you worked on? Uh, not everything here, but uh, quite a bit of it. Uh, you know, a lot of this, um, there's a lot of coffee table books below that you don't see that are stuff I worked on as well. So yeah, there's a, a little bit of everything spread out all over my office here. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so uh, for those who may not know, you're currently the Mad Cave Studio Senior VP of Business Development, which is a very cool title. And for our listeners, what does that actually mean? Um, that sort of means that... Uh, uh, you know, between myself and the owner of the company and our publisher, uh, we tend to run all of the day-to-day business. Um, uh, I handle the business side of things, um, but I also work with uh, the owner and the, and the publisher for just day-to-day operations. Um, I'm the guy that's out there getting licenses. Um, you know, we're the guy or I'm the guy that's helping review contracts, all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, the, the, the great thing about Matt Cave is that <laughs> for the most part, indie publishers have not had a, a great level of success in the history of comic book world. I mean, Cross Gen, um, what was the one? Uh, Malibu didn't go very well. Some of the others. But Matt Cave has held, been successful now for several, several years now. What do you think the key to Matt Cave's success has been? Oh, boy. Um, I think multiple things, honestly. Uh, we... <clears> this <throat> sounds trite to say it, but we actually really love storytelling. We love storytelling, we love creators, and um, the way we build our deals, the way we treat each other. Um, it's with a lot of kindness um, and a lot of an effort to um, make sure that we're putting forward the best product um, and the best sort of you know picture of who we are as a company um i think the other part that's really great is that outside of myself and a a few other people at mad cave um we have a staff that in general loves comics but isn't isn't like long toothed in the comic industry um so they're not jaded and they're not um they're not coming in with the same hackneyed ideas they're coming in with fresh ideas they come to the table um excited to work and you know and a lot of this stuff is a lot of the way ways of the direct market and those things you know that's all new to them and, and exciting to them so they find unique and different ways to approach it and um it, honestly it, it's what keeps me excited every day i wake up every day excited to do this job because of how great our team is here I can only imagine. I mean, once again, to be part of a publishing company that's been successful is a, is a hell of a thing. Because, like, like I said, I think um, 
there's a lot of people who are attempting to, to be in the small market uh, publishing world. Few, um, some have a little bit of success for a short period of time. Few have actually enjoyed a long term success, and that's how the thing that you guys be able to pull that off. Um, well, I think a big part of it too is our approach. Um, we, barring the stuff that I just talked about, um, we also try to look at the business as multi dimensional. Um, there's a lot of different ways to get publishing out there. Um, we try to look at all of it. Um, we try to approach all of it with different um, things that conform to those different markets. Um, and the idea is that in general, graphic storytelling really can apply to a great number of things. Um, it can apply to education. It can apply to entertainment. It can apply to stories and biographies that um, speak to you personally. Mm. Um, all of these things are part of, you know, what makes graphic storytelling so incredibly amazing and powerful. Um, far more powerful, in my opinion, than film or TV or radio or anything like that, because it's a mix, right? It's a mix yeah. of incredible art mixed with story ideas, mixed with your own brain, interpreting the way you read and all those things. So, um, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity to educate and to um, also entertain people um at the highest and and lowest levels you know um and we try to be we try to really approach all the markets that are available to us with all of those different things so as the senior vp of, uh you're basically part of the acquisition process for mad cave so when you're determining what is a mad cave book what is a mad cave book uh that's a great question um i would say that really our goal with the books that we acquire is there, there's a number of things that we hope for. Um, you know, one is we get a lot of great pitches that sometimes we still end up saying no to simply because we're already doing that same type of book. Um, hmm. We may have four or five titles in a row that approach that same material. And it's like, oh man, I really love this pitch, but it's basically the same pitch that we just printed five of. Um, hmm. So, you know, that that's one thing that we take into consideration. Um, we look for different types of art. We look for um, different approaches to storytelling ideas. Um, we look for exciting new voices. We look for veteran voices that have a great market. Um, so we, we, we try to be mindful of all of those things when we take a look at a, what constitute a mad, uh, constitutes a Mad K book. But the thing to remember is that we have three imprints um, and all three of those imprints are very different in what they publish. You know, Mad Cave, we're the direct market, we're the, we're the floppy, uh, the comic book, uh, 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 you know, publisher. So from that standpoint, it's a lot of um, genre entertainment, right? Horror, sci-fi, crime noir, um, fantasy, um, you know, basically almost everything outside of superheroes, you know, um, we try to approach in that arena um, and, and more from a ad, uh, more adult viewpoint as well. Um, Maverick, which is our YA uh, imprint, that imprint approaches things that are coming of age stories, um, finding out who you are, um, LGBTQ friendly, um, stories that involve um, when people's, you know, growing and maturing um all of those issues um are kind of contained within the pages of maverick titles and then paper cuts is our all ages imprint um we have a lot of licensed material in that imprint things like uh asterix and the smurfs and uh the loud house and uh, geronimo stilton you know soon to come miraculous ladybug um things like that but we also have inventive news stories that are geared toward um first first readers or new readers to the concepts that we're introducing um we have a book upcoming called uh children of the phoenix for instance it, which will be an incredible mix of prose and comic book illustration um that deals with science and there'll be very real science um information within that uh that series so you know just trying to find different approaches for different people but each one of those imprints kind of has an age grouping that is associated with it so 
Um, Matt Cave is about is is has acquired the rights to publish um Gotcha Man. Gotcha Man. Am I pronouncing it right? Gotcha Man. Gotcha Man. Yeah. Gotcha Man. Okay. Um, which imprint will that this be connected to? That will be a Mad Cave book. Um, and it's based off of the original 1972 to 1973 uh, animation cycle that appeared in Japan. It's not based off of the Battle of the Planets, um, you know, remake that we did over here in the States. It's based off the original material. Um, and it's going to be awesome. We're so excited about it because although we're kind of keeping with that early 70s thematically um designed bit about gotcha man um a lot of the themes that took place in that story are still very relevant themes um heavy heavy themes of environmentalism um heavy themes of um a constantly creeping um corporate entity uh within the world um again you know mucking about with environmental things so uh, a lot of those themes will be within the within what we're coming out with um we have some great creators who i can't announce just yet um working on that series but we're very very excited by where that's gonna go so because uh, to kind of connect to an earlier question i asked which is what is a mad cave comic why is gotcha man a mad cave comic then uh for many reasons but um chiefly you know um uh, uh, there's a group of us that that grew up with gotcha man and loved it um we also felt that it was a property that although it has been launched a few different times with a few different publishers here in the states um no disservice to those publishers but um you know the material had some good bits to it um maybe beautiful covers um but the stories weren't exactly compelling um so i think working directly with tatsuno koko um really understanding the properties really having them walk with us um because in the past the titles were um the titles were licensed by sandy frank which was the company that did battle the planets um so i think now we have a little more oversight from story development side um and it's a little more exciting because within the story development they're they're allowing us to expand that universe um so you'll get the familiarity that you already have with gotcha man i mean in many ways uh, for many people it's sort of the first anime that a lot of people became aware of um but in addition to that you're gonna have like this incredible story um i it's much darker than what people remember from Battle of the Planets, um, but but it's also really really heartfelt and um, has some terrific themes, as, as I mentioned earlier. So, why do you think Gotcha Man has been able to survive um, so long? What do you think is the, what is the key to its longevity? Oh my gosh, um, so many things. Uh, killer costumes, um, they're the best costumes I think. Uh, like some of the best designs ever. Um, I think the Again, the the themes of environmentalism, the th- the themes of things being one thing that changes into another thing. You know, the phoenix itself. Um, you know that all the all the subsequent giant robot things. You know, like almost all of that stuff grew in many ways out of what Gotcha Man represented. You know, um, so I think I think it, not only being the first, but being cool, like having that whole like um, mod squad uh you know aspect to it mod squad meets superheroes meets ninjas meets aliens meets giant you know uh gaijin and monster you know like all of this stuff like uh, it's or you know, kaiju sorry um all of those things you know like that's really exciting um all in one package so and the, the thing with um gotcha man let me say that it's this is a continuation from the tv series right this is a relaunch it isn't like a reimagining you took you're taking the series and you're continuing from where it ended right no, we are continuing within the series okay. and growing outward from the series as it existed. So you will see story uh, bits that allude directly to the series, the series that existed in 72 to 73. Um, but there will be growth beyond that as well. Um, and 
there are reasons why we are staying in that timeline um, that I can't really, you know, talk about, but um, there, the, it, it's, if you watch the original series, you'll recognize what we're doing, but you will learn more about the Gotcha Man universe than you ever knew because we are adding to it. So, so, so let's, on. so let's build the beans on this. Um, so, um, so the series, once again, so you're not going beyond where the first, where the original series had ended right so it, is it so no. is it weaving between the other episodes that that have been out and how difficult is it to live in that space uh not difficult at all um actually the the um the pitch that uh we gave um tatsuno koko kind of blew them away because i don't think i thought that i think they expected sort of a, a retelling of the series coupled with maybe some asides mm. uh what we brought to them was a whole new um, imagining of of the series um from different perspectives and uh with a a, a lot of added material um new characters a lot, a lot of growth um so they're very excited by it so because this is built upon what has existed how difficult will it, would it be for new readers to jump onto the series and understand what is happening i don't think it'll be hard at all um you know the the basic core concept of gotcha man is very simple um you know five teenagers brought together by a secret world science organization to fight uh encroaching environmental uh issues um, many of which are personified by <laughs> giant kaiju, um, and and along the way find out that there's actually a, an alien conspiracy that is directing the kaiju um, to take over the earth. So, you know, th th those are pretty simple concepts. So, as they should be. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the series um, first existed in the 1970s. I think it was 72, 70. Three, something like that 72 to 73 was the first uh first season yeah which is obviously sometime in the past <laughs> without sitting around doing sitting around doing the math on that um because it is more or less 50 a 50 year old story okay mm -hmm. how will you ensure that it maintains relevant to modern readers well like i said uh i think the the big themes the environmentalism um heroism um teamwork um science uh all of those things are it, it, if they're not timeless they they should be uh <laughs> there's, certain, there's certainly things i think that concern most of us even today um and there are things that we care about and there are things that we root for and things that uh we want to continue so yeah i don't i don't think it'll, it'll have too hard of a time uh, crossing that 50-year gap so is it good or sad that we're still dealing with the same problems as apparently we did 50 years ago and haven't quite figured it out yet? No, it's certainly sad. It's certainly sad. But, you know, like anything else, uh, the more education you have, um, the more people become aware of problems, the 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 quicker the solutions come. Um, and I think I think environmentalism is something that, you know, half the world cares about and half the world doesn't. Um hmm. And I think it's always something that is important. And we're seeing every day we see the effects, you know, global mm. warming is an effect of, you know, poor environmental policy. So, um, you know, hopefully people start waking up. Yeah. So um, another thing that has changed in the last 50 years is the way society interacts with itself, um, how we talk to each other, um, issues social issues things of that nature um how what changes need to be made to this needed to be made to this property for it to feel like the characters exist in the social socially aware 2023 um i think some of the things that people might be familiar with from watching battle of the planets um i think some of that stuff goes away um you know i i think um the the growth of the characters um you know in 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 the original cartoon you know to a certain extent the team leader and um joe who was sort of his second man you know they were they were they led a lot of the things 
Um, I think what you'll see with our approaches, that is not always the case. Um, so that that's that's that that's part of the change. I think also um, because all of us are, you know, hyper aware of just being respectful to everyone. Um, I think that that shines through in all of our books. Um, we we make an effort for it too. Um, so I think Gotcha Man will be no exception. Um, and I think that the licensor Tatsunoko Co is also very aware of those things and wants exactly those same things. Mm. So and another thing is, um, so the team basically fights an, an international terrorist organization known as Galactor. Am I saying it correctly, Galactor? Yeah. Yeah. All right, Galactor, perfect. Um, another thing, um, talking about things that have changed in the last 50 years is the term terrorist organization. Um, is How is that approach differently than, because once again, of modern history than may have been in the 70s? Well, I think, um, you know, based on who Galactor truly is, which is an alien uh, conspiracy, um, I think that you'll see you know, some reaction to that and some change to that. I think also, um, in many ways, the Gotcha Man cartoon was was quite progressive. Um, you know, there was, there are many things about that show that um, I think works successfully in our day and age. Um, you know, I mean, the, the main villain it might be the first transgendered, you know, <laughs> transgendered uh, uh, character um, in, you know, on American TV. And I think like they actually went out of their way when they did uh, Battle of the Planets to um, change that. Um, but the original cartoon, you know, that character is both a male and a female, you know, um, and it, it, that was definitely a new thing back then. So I think, you know, we can lean into some of those themes um, along with, again, um, the fact that it's a it's a, a team of five equals, um, all who have great strengths um, and all five who have their own weaknesses. Um, and there are things to explore within that as well. Um, and, you know, it, the world back in the 70s was had a lot of the same problems. We still do. Today. We still do. Today. Um, racial inequality was obviously a massive problem um and still is um you know uh mob mentality all of those things were mm. still problems then that are problems now just like environmentalism um and i think you know we can talk to many of those themes and when we're thinking about this are we talking about a limited series or this is ongoing and when we say ongoing how ongoing are we talking it's ongoing. Um, you know, we 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 have the license for quite a while, um, and we're excited to uh, continue telling the adventures of uh, of the Science Ninja team. So, um, you know, we'll we'll see. You know, obviously, uh, we have pretty great plans for all the way into uh, 2025. I think we're we made most of our publishing schedule all the way through 2025. Mm. Uh, so at least that far we'll see uh, we'll see we'll see from there you know um th those plans are always growing and changing like on, on an almost weekly or even daily basis so so i know you said you can't mention who the writing and artist team is but let's talk writing an artist uh <laughs> <laughs> so when you talk about who the writing and artist team is for this um so two questions come to mind first are these gonna be names that we recognize um and in the comic book industry are these like known quantities are these you know more on the indie quantity that are, are now going to be on the on a bigger stage How, what, what can you say yes to both of those things for both the writer and the artist <laughs> yes to both of those things yes all right uh, very cool both both, both uh, recognizable names as well as uh, uh indie creators who already were recognizable names and uh you know, are on a, I guess, a bigger stage for the license licensing uh, aspect of things. Um, let's see if I can, I'm just going to see if I can just nudge a little bit <laughs> out of you. Um, when you were assembling this writing artist team, um, what were you looking for from them? Are these people who have done, because they've done sci-fi before or the particular connection to gotcha men, or is this a team that just has worked well together in the past and you're bringing them back? Oh, no. Um, 
to I I can share that uh we have multiple writers um and multiple artists and I can share that all of them have been worked with by our team uh multiple times in the past um in various ways and at various companies um you know mad cave is made up of people from other other companies as well you know um we all have a past um <laughs> but uh but in addition i i can share that um specifically on the writing um that they're all massive gotcha man fans and they're working together um and crafting a a multi-tiered story um that okay. I, we hope will blow people away um there there's some really great stuff happening so to nudge you a little bit further um <laughs> when you when you say there's multiple writers on the series, what does this mean? Are you talking about each one's doing an arc and then they go into a different arc? Are they are these talking about stories and backup stories, or are these sort of like a writing room of, of writers who are working on the series? A writing room of writers working on the series. Can you go into a little bit of how that works? Um, basically, uh, one of the writers um, sort of came with a overarching proposal. Um, the other writers that are uh, part of that room uh, came in and added to it and built on it and uh, and actually built out from it. Um, and that's sort of sort of the approach that we took. Um, we know that you know Tatsunokoko was was kind of blown away that we were willing to go as far as we did. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's the way I describe that. Now from looking at from once again the writing perspective and the writers involved um uh, obviously this is a comic book that is but mad cave but as you said is um owned by tossing on uh, oko um i'll probably get the name right. i'm doing my best um, <laughs> how much becomes an issue of editorial mandates where you now the writers have to go through mad cave and then go through a second entity to write what they want to write or is it basically trust the writers they, they're on the job they kind of have freedom to do what they want to do with it uh it's a mix of both anytime you work on anything license um you know depending on the license or there are levels of of uh oversight and some licensors are looser than others um some licensors are very specific you can only do this um mm. every licensor is different in the case of tatsunoko um i would say that they are very um they're in the middle of those two things. There, there are certain things that we know we can't do or talk about, um, and there's specific reasons as to why. Um, but they've been very good about giving us that information up front rather than coming to us as writers are turning in material and saying, "Oh yeah, we forgot to tell you, you can't do that." You know, mm. um, they've been very good about saying, "Here's here's sort of our broad parameters. Um, you guys can play in this all you want." Um, you know, just these are the parameters. Um, and so far, so good. Um, you know, we've had very little pushback on the broader concept of what we're doing, um, let alone the individual concepts. And um, what little pushback there's been, there's all, they, they're very good about saying, and this is why. And, mm -hmm. and it's always very understandable because we're not the only game that Tatsunoko Ko is playing you know they they have they have a lot of things out there um a lot of really exciting things so um you know for us we just we just want to be a part of that that growth that they're trying to do okay so since you mentioned that um when you talk about gotcha man are, when you, are, are you suggesting then that this is part of a larger rollout from Tats and you know of the company um <laughs> uh, is this part of a larger rollout where we're talking about other media now and this is and we're just going to be seeing a bigger push behind the property not just a comic book i'm gonna say i think so because i'm pretty sure i signed an nda <laughs> <laughs> okay so because of listening to this larger rollout what is mad caves positioning in that how does it affect what you can do because of the larger rollout as far as I know, it doesn't affect anything. Um, our launch and rollout is, you know, we 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 built a plan, we brought it to Tatsunoko, they approved the plan, and we're just plowing ahead. Um, you know, we if there are other partners out there, if there's other stuff happening, um, obviously we we love it, we get excited by it. Um, 
but for us, it doesn't affect what we're doing. All right, Mr. Irwin, thank you so much for coming to the Versus Stars podcast. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you so much.